Wait, wait. Seriously? Are, are we really doing this today? Is it finally time? Are we finally doing the Mont Blanc Nolan video? Is this it? Is are, are we in it right now? Am I making it right now at this moment? Oh my god, Usopp! Barry dreams can come true! Miracles exist! Oh my god! <laughs> I didn't think we'd ever make it, guys. I never thought we'd make it to this day. I love you all. Okay. I guess I should probably explain what the hell that's all about for those of you that are just joining the channel. If you just joined up in the channel, like if you subscribed in the last week or so, you're like, okay, what? And he's like, all right, cool. And by the way, nice to meet you and welcome to the channel. I'm teching. This is Barry. He's a brick. You know, what are you going to do? All right. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've been doing One Piece videos, I think since like late 2016, right? So, you know, normally the process of how I make videos is like, hey, I'm going to make a video about the Boa siblings and then I just do it. Or, hey, I'm going to make another video about Boa Hancock. I think there's like seven on the channel right now or I'm gonna do a whole series dedicated to geography cuz it's everything right well you know every now and then I'll come up with an idea for a video and I won't do it right then and there I'll kind of put it on the back shelf I'll be like okay yeah I have some other projects to focus on but yeah that that'll be an interesting video to do later and uh, maybe several months will go by and then I won't be any closer to doing it so I'll take it off that shelf and move it to a more lonely shelf and then even more time passes and I'll take it off of that shelf and then throw it into my closet where it collects dust and cobwebs and that's pretty much where we're at right now with the Nolan video. It's been sitting in that closet for, I want to say, maybe like two, probably closer to three years now. <laughs> Since the time went from, I was like, hey, I'm going to do a Nolan video to the moment, like right now, where we're actually doing the Nolan video. It's finally happening. This is it. Was it everything that you wanted it to be? We're talking about Nolan, and that's what we're locking into, okay? He's got an acorn on his head, so you know he's a badass. Um, I actually have an acorn right here. I picked this up last fall, and I just carried it around. I just kept it in my drawer, you know, on the off chance I would ever do the Nolan video. I just wanted to have an acorn ready to go. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much all that that is. I didn't think I was like, hey, Acorn Nolan video. Maybe maybe it would be interesting, but yeah, I'll try to put it on Barry, I guess, if it balances correct. Oh no, actually, that balanced really well. Okay, there you go. Barry is a Mont Blanc. Okay, so let's get right into it. Right? Okay, lock in. <clears throat> Mont Blanc Nolan was an admiral. Wait, what? Mont Blanc Nolan was an admiral. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, Mont Blanc Nolan was an admiral. All right, so 400 years ago, well before Garp and Sengoku and all the admirals that we know today, pff, Kizaru, please. Nolan was a serious admiral. That was back when the Marines meant something, right? No, of course, okay. He was an admiral, but not in, like, the Marine sense. You don't have to be a Marine to be an admiral. I know that that term is usually used mainly when you're talking about, like, Fujitora or, you know, Kizaru or whatever. Um, then whenever you hear the term Admiral in One Piece, that's usually who you actually think of, the Marine Admirals. But no, Admiral just means that you are the leader of a fleet of ships. And they don't have to be Marine ships, they could be pirate ships, or they could be just regular explorer ships, which is what Nolan headed up. Uh, all the Yonko, for instance, would probably be considered Admirals, like Big Mom, Kaido, uh, Blackbeard, I think his actual epithet is Admiral. Uh, Don Krieg, he was considered a Don or an Admiral as well, because he commanded a whole fleet of like 50 ships or whatever. So yeah, that's what Nolan was back in the day. Nolan lived 400 years ago before the present storyline, so keep in mind, this was well before pretty much every character that has been introduced in the main story of One Piece was alive, okay? This was well before Roger and Rox, Garp, you know, even the most old, like, even before Dr. Kareha, even before Dory and Broggy. Dory and Broggy are, like, a little bit over 100 years old, so that's even well before their time. This was even before, you know, the, uh, those two giants we saw in Big Mom's flashback, like the Elders of Elbaf, you know, Lord Fallbeard and Lord Mount Beard. I think they were only like actually this this might have been around the time because I think that was Big Mom's flashback that was like 60 something years ago and they were already like 300 something at that point so this might have been the time like they were born okay so this is a long time ago the only other thing going on like 400 years ago that goes off the immediate top of my head for the One Piece timeline was that was right around the time Ryuma was alive and doing his exploits and he was being revered as the god of the sword or the sword god from Wano. So along the same time that Ryuma was slicing dragons down above the flower capital, Mont Blanc Noland was a mighty explorer from the Livel Kingdom in the North Blue, sailing paradise in the New World. And keep in mind, this was decades, centuries before Roger sailed the freaking Grand Line, okay? So, the title of Pirate Graveyard, it, that was, like, even more serious back then, because 
because literally this was like an uncharted ocean of just death. You know, that was pretty much where it was, okay? I don't even know if they figured out how to navigate it at that point. Like, did they even figure out that they could use log poses at this point? What did they use before log poses? Well, I don't know, but, you know, Nolan might have been the one that actually pioneered this crap, right? So Nolan, as I already mentioned, was an explorer or an adventurer, however you exactly want to, you know, classify him as. Adventurer sounds cooler, but explorer is, like, more professional. Uh, he also was a botanist. He knew a little bit about medical science. He was a really good captain. Uh, just an all-around pretty pretty cool guy. Also, he was straight up ripped. Just check out those guns! He's also got a sword shaped like an acorn because, as well, that says he has an acorn hat, and that's just how he goes about it, you know? Well, are you gonna make fun of this guy for the acorn hat? I'm not gonna make fun of this guy for the acorn hat. And so he was uh, from the Levnil Kingdom. That's from the north. And the Levnil Kingdom, at least, you know, a couple decades ago, still exists. It was actually one of the places that Corazon took Law on his little esca escapade to try to cure Law's, um, you know, Amber Lead Syndrome. Remember that? One of the hospitals they went to was in the Livnil Kingdom, and Oda himself even clarified, like, yeah, they're the same place. So the kingdom still exists to this day. Uh, everybody in the North Blue pretty much knows the story of Noland, even Sanji that grew up in the Germa Kingdom that was kind of isolated from the rest of the North, you know, their little mobile kingdom and being raised by mercenaries, essentially. Even Sanji read the book of Nolan the Liar, so it's pretty prominent in the North Blue territory. It seems like the North Blue territory gets all the cool, like, uh, you know, pop cultural stuff. So they get Nolan the Liar, that's a really famous book, and they also get, like, a Sora, Night of the Sea, and all that crap, you know? It's just, like, everybody in the North gets all this really cool stuff, and otherwise in the world, like, you don't hear any, like, who is the superhero from the South Blue? Chopper Mask, that's who! He comes from the Torino Kingdom to deal out birdie reindeer justice. But, yeah, that's just how that goes in One Piece. Um, so the reason he got the epithet of the liar, though, was because of his most famous adventure that he went on. He went on several adventures throughout his life. He was the one that he discovered the Tontadas, um, and the Tontadas to this day living on Green Bit, they still revere him as, like, a savior. Uh, he introduced agriculture to a bunch of different places in the world. Uh, he was a botanist, like I said, so this makes sense. He was kind of like Heracles in, in that regard, right? So, you know, he was referenced when the Straw Hats arrived at Green Bit. There was a statue of Noland, you know, in the Tontada city, and they also called, like, everybody, like, Uso land because the Tontadas just assumed like, oh, Noland was a human so therefore all humans names have to end in land or Landu because it's it's Japan. So it's Uso Landu, you know, Robin Landu. That's just how it goes. That's how the Tontadas assumed it. So, you know, he had a bunch of other adventures all throughout the world, uh, discovered various locations. I'm sure there's plenty of islands in the world that would have not have been discovered if it wasn't for Noland's escapades. Not just in the, uh, not just in the Grand Line either, but all over the world because, you know, 400 years ago, keep in mind, I like to think that after the world government took over, after the Void Century, so like 800 years ago, they did one of those cleansings, one of those, you know, divine reset button kind of deals. So when they took over, everything was kind of like, you know, very shaky. So that kind of led the adventurer and explorer market to be brand new, whatever the world government might have done to like massively destroy or reshape the world in the process. So then you have adventurers like Nolan going out and exploring, you know? And, it, and I know in One Piece often, whenever we see people uh, traveling on the high seas, we think of uh, Marines or revolutionaries or pirates, but there are other career opportunities in the One Piece world. They do exist. You could be a baker, for instance. That's, yeah, that's what every villain in One Piece does after they're defeated by Luffy. They go and become a baker somewhere, right? I also love Nolan's design and the whole, you know, point of his character because I could totally see Usopp becoming this at the end of One Piece. Um, Usopp right now is, of course, a pirate and all that stuff, but I think Usopp, his major goal is, I want to become a brave warrior of the sea. Well, you don't have to be a pirate to be a brave warrior of the sea. Look at Noland, okay? 100%, like the, like the definition, like if you look in a dictionary, like brave warrior sea, you're going to see a picture of Noland, right? So I could see Usopp doing this in his old older years, you know, in his, in his, uh, his retirement, his twilight days, you know, he's like 60 years old and he's an adventurer, that great adventurer, Captain Usopp, you know, so for one thing, he's carrying on Nolan's legacy, Nolan was revered as, well, he was revered as a great adventurer, but he was infamous for being a liar because of the story. We'll get to that in a second, because that's, like, the main story of Noland. Um, you know, but also, Usopp himself is a liar that tells a lot of tall tales. So, yeah, I, I could see that kind of carrying on his legacy. And they even, like, even the Tontadas kind of referred to him, like, oh, yeah, there's a statue of Noland and a statue of Usopp now in, in the Green Bit City. So that's just how that goes, right? 
Right, so as the story goes, Nolan was traveling paradise, you know, the Grand Line one day, and he discovers the island of Jaya. Of course, back then, this was before Jaya split because of the knock stream, so Jaya looked like a skull in the middle of the ocean, right? So, mm, Nolan's like, that's an interesting island layout. You know, we sketch the, you know, island, you know, the map of it and everything like that. They go on the island and they discover the city of gold, Shandora. Of course, Kalgra and the other Shandians were living there at that point because they went down from the moon and they ended up in the Blue Sea. That's just how you do it. And uh, upon and arriving in the island, though, they discovered uh, a small boy named Seto that was afflicted with a deadly disease called tree fever. And, uh, you know, uh, Nolan figured out, like, oh, okay, I get it. This is, uh, like, an uncontacted tribe of people uh, that are afflicted by this disease. But this disease is actually very curable with modern science, okay? So he wants to help the people out, but he stumbles across a sacrifice going down in the middle of this altar with this uh, giant snake god thing. I mean, it's not really a god. You know, it clearly was not Eneru, but it's a giant snake, and the people revered it as a god, right? And so this girl is about to be sacrificed by this thing, and what does Nolan do? Of course, being Nolan, he just shows us, like, wait, shink, stop, and then boom, Nolan just kills these people's god because he's Nolan. Why wouldn't he, right? It's just like, I love that. That that really honestly does sound like a D&D &D kind of plot. Like, you guys land on an island and you stumble across, like, a sacrificial altar and there's a big ceremony going down with the indigenous population and there's a woman tied to an altar and then this giant snake just emerges from, I cast fireball at its face! And like, alright, oh, that did a lot of damage. Oh, you got a crit. Okay, so, yeah, um, the god, uh, giant snake is now burnt to a crisp. It is, it is dead you have killed these people's god so at that point it's just well this could go one of two ways you know this can either go the you killed our god all of the known world will now fall apart surely you've brought the end of days you've brought ragnarok upon us you acorn wearing man uh or it could go the opposite way of like oh you killed our god, so therefore that means you are greater than our god, which means you are our new god! Bow down to the acorn-wearing man, right? Yeah, that doesn't go that way for Nolan. Um, to, uh, the people are pretty pissed off at him for, for doing that. Uh, there was also uh, bad luck for Nolan. There also happened to be an earthquake at the same time, like right around the same time when uh, he kills their god. So um, Nolan actually ends up getting trapped uh, while bringing the cure to the you know the people on the island. He gets trapped in a, in a crevice, in a crack in the ground because of the earthquake. At the same time, the child of the god, so another giant snake, appears in this forest, and then their hero Kagra arrives. Kagra is, of course, the big hero, the greatest warrior of the Shandorians, even to this day with Wiper, and every Wiper is a descendant of Kagra, and even to this day, they revere him as like, oh, he is the mightiest of might, he is the greatest Shandorian that ever lived, and it's through his blood and his will that we'll, uh, we'll defeat the Skypeans, we'll push them back and stuff. Like, that's the whole deal for the Skypea saga, like, that's what happens, right? So he meets Kagura there, and Kagura is like, at first, he's just like, you're, you're like, like you're a, a foreign devil that came to this land, killed our god, and now there's a giant earthquake. That's like literally all your fault. Which you know, like this is back during the times, like these people are uncontacted, and right, so you know, their god dies, and then the earth god starts being pissed off and be like, oh crap, that's not good. So uh, Nolan though tries to explain to Kagura, he's like, you don't understand. I have the cure. That disease that's wiping you all out, that afflicted a bunch of other tribes too but we have a cure now okay this is like modern science develop this you know I, I just please take it like even if I die just take the cure and give it to your people and they'll be able to be cured okay and so Kalgara actually you know he, he looks at Nolan and he sees he's not lying he sees he's not just begging for his life he seems genuine like okay this guy actually means that this is a cure okay so Kalgara is actually the one to slay the child of their god so a <laughs> lot of god slaying going on in this flashback by the way, this is one of the best flashbacks in all of One Piece. Seriously, it's great. The um, the bro bond that Kalgura and Nolan share, I just love it, alright? So, Kalgura kills the child of the god, but don't worry, there is a grandchild, which of course was, uh, uh, was it Nala or Nola? I think it was Nola. That that was the snake that appeared in Skypea that Luffy gets swallowed by, um, and Isa, they also get swallowed by the snake, and they find all the treasure inside of it. Yeah, that was the snake that appears in Skypea 400 years later. During Nolan's time, it was just a tiny little like regular snake um but it would grow up to become huge right so that there's the origin of that um 
But at any rate, yeah, so they begin to trust each other, and he rescues Noland, and they take the cure, and they give it to the people of the island, and everything seems pretty okay for a while. Nolan spends a lot of time there, Sh uh, the Shandorians kind of welcome him in, uh, the woman that was going to be sacrificed ends up marrying the guy that they first fed the little kid, Seto, Seto Kaiba! They arrive at the island, they found him sick kid, and they cured him, and then he grows up, and he eventually marries the, uh, the, the girl that was going to be sacrificed, so that's cool, and, uh, of course, Cal you know, shows him around the city and shows him this is the Golden Belfry. The Golden Bel Belfry, by the way, was the thing that actually led Nolan to the island. What the story with that is they got lost in a storm one night and they were, you know, they, they heard the sound of the bell, this majestic, beautiful ringing of this bell, and that's what led them to Jai to begin with. So, Nolan and Kagra, they become really close friends, and he stays on the island for a while. However, um, one thing happens, you know, leads to another, and the good times just can't last. This is a One Piece uh, flashback we're talking about here. Can you name, like, seriously, like, can you name one flashback that occurs in this story that, like, like a flashback arc? I'm not talking about just, like, a single flashback to a particular moment in the story. I'm talking about, like, a flashback arc in the story of One Piece that actually has, like, a good happy overtone and ending like nothing, nothing really messed up happens nobody dies no one gets thrown in like a dungeon or anything like that or gets carried away by the sea train i'm looking at you tom just a flashback where everybody's cool i don't think that happens i think the the closest thing we have to an okay sort of uh flashback is the one where um usopp's mom dies because yeah usopp's mom does die but his dad is still alive so that's something right yeah, because, yeah, the mo most of them don't end very well, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. No, yeah, Law's entire town gets wiped out. Yeah, Kuina dies and Zoro's. It's just, it's just a, no a matter of, like, how many people die in the flashback. That's more of the metric, you know? It's not about if there's nobody that dies in the flashback arc. It's just, okay, how few people die in the flashback arc, right? Okay. So, uh, what happens is Nolan discovers that the cause of the disease were the type of trees that grew on the island. It was the island's uh, flora that was actually causing the disease. And so he sees these trees and he's like, oh, if these trees are left on this island and the town and the people in the island, they begin to like interact with them, they're going to get sick. So I'm just going to cut down these trees and then that way the disease will never come back and we have the cure. <laughs> Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Modern science! Cut them down, men! And so without... I mean, I understand why Nolan did it, because at this point he was kind of friends with Calgra and everything, and they trusted each other, and from Nolan's perspective, they were just trees. They were just, like, poisonous trees that would kill the indigenous people. So, he's like, yeah, we're just gonna cut them down. Still, you think, Nolan, you might have should have asked Calgra first? You know, at least, like, brought it up to him and be like, hey, Calgra, uh... We discovered the trees outside your island, you know, in that one forest. They're actually the cause of all the disease and strife that you've been experiencing. So if we just, we're, we're actually going to cut them down this afternoon and then you won't have to worry about getting sick anymore. You, you should, like, this could have been solved by just bringing that up, right? But um, unfortunately, Nolan doesn't and he just takes it upon himself to cut all the trees, like just mass deforestation at once. Of course, when Calgara discovers it, he gets pissed as well as the other Shandorians because that was like a sacred forest. Those were like sacred trees. Um, I do believe there are some indigenous, uh, you know, beliefs in certain, like in our world, where like the souls of the dead uh, migrate to animals, or in this case, you know, plant life, so the souls of the dead like literally go into trees, and I think that was the basis for that as well, like those were sacred trees where like our ancestors dwell after they died, right, and so Nolan just literally killed like every ancestor these people have ever had, because they grow up on this island believing that like, oh, don't worry, you know, your grandma isn't really dead her spirit dwells in the tree you know and so then nolan's just like well whoa that was a busy afternoon i cut down all those trees man there were a lot of them back there wow but don't worry guys me and the crew hacked them all down to pieces ripped the stumps out you won't have to worry about those trees anymore <laughs> what's with all the what's with all the swords guys why why are y'all coming at me? Hey, wait, whoa! <laughs> yeah, so, um, Nolan ends up having to leave. He does, I think, frantically explain the situation to Kalgara, but he does get chased off the island, and he sails back to the Neil Kingdom. However, as he's sailing away, I think Kalgara does say, he's like, Nolan, you can come back someday! The Golden Bell will, will summon you! You can follow it back! And Nolan's like, I will, my friend! I will! So, you know, they don't depart under the best circumstances, um, but there does seem to be a a bit of a bond there, right? It didn't just get severed right at that moment. Yeah, you know, that's a bond that will last for hundreds of years to come. 
So Noland, I mean, he's, it's his day job. He's an adventurer. He's an explorer. So what do you do? Well, you go back to the place where you were hired to adventure. I mean, he lives in the Livnil kingdom and he has the, the king of the kingdom was like, Noland, I hereby decree you as an official explorer of the Livnil kingdom. Go out to the world, young lad, explore and find a shit ton of gold to come bring back to me because I'm the king, right? So Nolan goes back and he's like, Ah, oh, Nolan, my boy, how did your uh, adventure go? You've been gone quite some time. Did you discover anything interesting upon your journey? Yeah, this is also something else. You'd think Nolan would have just said, Oh, nope, King, I, I found nothing. I mean, we, we found some treasure, but, you know, nothing huge. Because you, you know what's going to happen, right, Nolan? Like, you understand if you tell the king that there's a city of gold in the Grand Line, you know what's going to happen, right? Like, remember that one dude, the conquistador? I forget what his name was. I think it was, uh, oh man, was it as Francisco or something? There was like a, an explorer from Spain, and he was the one that kind of blew the whole El Dorado thing out of proportion. El Dorado, by the way, as far as I understand, El Dorado was not a city or a kingdom or anything like that. El Dorado was the term for a specific, like, king or ruler in, like, a, a South American, like, tribe, right? Like, it, in some Aztec or uh, Mayan society. I think it was Aztec. Anyway, yeah. But there's, a you know, the explorers that came over, the conquistadors from Spain, I think they're the ones that either misinterpreted what El Dorado was or they decided to blow it out of proportion because they were exploring a new world and they thought, like, they're... They they had this uh, picture of like a great city of gold somewhere, and I think El Dorado got ballooned out of proportion from uh, a man, a single king or whatever, or a hero to oh, it's a, it's a temple, it's a golden temple. No, it's a it's a golden city. No, it's even one step beyond that. It's a golden empire, a land of gold as far as the eye could see. And so, yeah, that, that's pretty much what's going to happen. So Noland explains to his king like, oh yeah, I found a city of gold, and the king was like. Good job, everybody clap. Yes, good job. Well, that's a damn good explorer right there. That's what I was waiting for. All these other, everybody else is fired. What did you find? I just found a city of bronze, sir. F your city of bronze. He found a city of gold. So let's rock, right? So the king was like, yeah, sure. Let's, let's, let's get all of my guards and my personal like entourage together. Let's, let's, I'll even go. Come on, let's, this old coot can get off his throne. We can just go find a damn city of gold, right? So they get on Nolan's ship and they all sail off into the Grand Line again to find the city of gold. However, uh, once again, just bad timing. The knock up stream blast the half of Jaya, not even all of Jaya, just the half of Jaya that happens to have the City of Gold in it, straight into the damn stratosphere, and 10,000 meters up into the White White Sea, which by the way, Nolan did not, Nolan, uh, I actually believe he actually bought the waiver off a trader, there was a trader somewhere, not a traitor, a trader, he found a trader, and he bought this waiver off of him, and he was trying to figure out how it worked and everything, like, oh, this is very strange, a waiver, okay, so maybe Nolan might have had some idea that there was something up there, but nothing really major, and so he doesn't, he doesn't arrive to that conclusion, so they're sailing around for the while, and finally, after retracing their steps, they find the island, but it's only half of the island, all the Shandorians are gone at this point, you know, a Kalgra and the City of Gold and everybody, that's got, that got rocketed into the sky. All that was left in the Blue Sea was just an ordinary island covered with an ordinary jungle. No city, no nothing. Just, just, a uh, just a jungle. And so the king, obviously, is just like... <sighs> No, no, sir, I can explain. There was definitely a city of gold here. No, I met this guy named Kagra, and I killed their god. It was a giant snake, and then I got stuck in an earthquake, and I had the cure for the disease, and I, uh... I'm gonna die, aren't I? Mm. I imagine the king was just like, turn the ship around. We'll talk about this once we get back home. And the entire, that was, that was an awkward boat ride, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, the entire time, freaking Nolan's just sitting there like, <laughs> you know, like, ah, oh, crap. So they get back to the Livnil Kingdom, and that's when everybody, therefore, you know, uh, just lambasts Nolan as a liar. Oh, the great liar Nolan, yeah. He found a city of gold. <laughs> He also says he found the he found these tontadas somewhere. I did find the tontadas. They they were I introduced pumpkins into their society. 
whatever, you liar. He also says there's giant cow sea kings somewhere in the Grand Line. No, no, those are real. You should definitely avoid the Grand Line from now on. <laughs> I bet he also wants us to believe that somewhere dragons actually exist. Also, those are a thing. You should definitely... Whatever, you know. Um, so yeah, he's regarded as a liar. Nobody takes anything he says seriously uh, up until the day he dies, which was pretty quick because he was therefore, you know, thrown in the dungeon and summarily executed. Um, and the last thing on Nolan's mind when he was being executed, I mean, he does say he's like, "Hey, I think the, uh, I think the island might have sunk, uh, maybe into the ocean. Yeah, check the bottom of the ocean. It might be down there. Who knows? I don't know what happened to the damn thing. Did you guys not see how unpredictable the Grand Line is? Look at the weather going on." here it might have happened in the like, earthquake there was an earthquake when i was there it might have split Pfft, whatever this guy's talking like island sink or something no you don't understand there's this thing called plate tectonics and Pfft, plate tectonics the earth isn't on the freaking dinner plates what are you crazy man execute him it's like no seriously <laughs> So, he gets executed. The last thing he thinks about, though, is Kagura. He thinks about his his friend Kagura, and he's like, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you again, Kagura. I'm sorry, friend. I hope one day we'll be reunited. And then Kagura, though, is still alive. He's in the sky fighting off the the, the Skypeans and the Brickens and everybody else. Like, this, like, oh, this is Verth. This is, like, holy ground. We can take this place for our own. But it was inhabited by the Shandorians, and that kicked off this war between the Sky Races and the Shandorians for, like, 400 years. The whole Eneru thing didn't happen until only like six years before the actual main storyline they were waging war for centuries before this uh throughout the generations all the way down to wiper who is now the current like chief of the shandorians all right well i think they have like a village elder but wiper is like their greatest warrior like he's the head like, like warrior and stuff like that their hero right so yeah that's of course the straw hats fix all that and they you know they reunite everybody and so they understand what's going on now but yeah still 400 years of strife and that was pretty complicated there right so anyway yeah nolan's uh legacy is still continues to this day as a liar uh, where uh, books are being printed you know this is Nolan the liar and they make him out to be a little idiot you know like the little caricature of Nolan like doing this stupid grinning smile like there I found a city of gold <laughs> what are you gonna do guys I'm a liar you know what the really sad thing is um so obviously the Straw Hats and the Shandorians and the Sky Races and everybody, like the Sky Peans and everybody, they all know the truth now because they found out the truth. And uh, you know, Montblanc Cricket, who's the descendant of Noland, who still lives on Jaya with the uh, the Sariyama Alliance. You know, they, they all believe it as well, because they heard the golden bell, and, you know, Cricket heard it from Jai, and he's like, oh, okay, that's what happened to the City of Gold. It got blasted into the sky. That makes sense, sure. And so he goes off on another adventure with the Sariyama Alliance, with Mashra and uh, Shoujo and everything. But the rest of the world... They still view Noland as a liar. The rest of the world, the book is still being circulated. It's not like, it doesn't get like, uh, oh yeah, Morgan's is like, big news, big news, everybody. The World Economic Journal, front page news. Turns out Noland wasn't a liar. Be like, that happened like 400 years ago. Like, it's not even like, I'm sure there's people in the world that don't even consider Noland as a real person. They probably just think of him as like a fairy tale. You know, it's just like, was he a real person? It's kind of like Robin Hood, where it's like, was Robin Hood real? I don't think he was, was he? I don't think he was. Like, I'm not even being funny right now. Like, was Robin Hood a, wheel, a real person? I, I don't think he was. But it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I'm sure there could have been some traveling, like, thief back in the day that could have stolen money from the rich and given it to the poor. I'm sure a person like that, probably multiple people like that, did exist at one point during that time period. But I don't know if they actually called themselves Robin Hood or if that was a thing that came up later, right? So maybe that's how Nolan became, like, a legend, sort of. It's just like, oh, yeah, it's a story that, you know, mothers tell their kids to, like, don't lie now or you'll end up like Nolan, executed on a scaffolding like the King of the Pirates. So don't tell lies, kids. And yeah, that's the situation that we're at right now. Just a story that parents tell their kids and his uh, his true story will never probably be heard of. Maybe at the end of the story, maybe at the end of the manga, when the Straw Hats go maybe their separate ways, maybe Robin will write a book or something. That'd be cool. Robin will write a book like the true story of Mont Blanc Nolan and have like a crap ton of historical data to back it up and just be like, no, no, seriously. Like I went to Skypea, I found the island. I, yeah, Nolan was, turns out it was telling the truth. That would actually be really cool. That's one of those things because like no one 
everyone in the current storyline of One Piece is like referencing Noland. It's not like next chapter Kaido's gonna bring up Noland or something, right? So nowadays we're not thinking about Noland that much, but that would be actually really cool if by the end of the story Oda just puts that in there. It could just be like a background thing. Like, you know, at the very end of the story we get like a 10 year epilogue and the Straw Hats are all separated. They're all doing their own thing in the world. And you just hear it like, like secondhand. You just hear like, oh yeah, I heard Robin wrote a book about the true story of Noland and it's selling really well. That's all. That's all I need right there. Just like maybe like two sentences and stuff and everything everything is copacetic from that point onward so yeah um last thing i wanted to bring up before i leave is that when i was doing research for nolan today i discovered something crazy i always love when i'm reading about one piece because of course oda incorporates a lot of like real world historical information and myth and things into one piece right so it connects back to our world right well when i was uh, reading the wiki for nolan this morning because that's where i start for pretty much everything i do on one piece you know look at the wiki first and then branch out from there um in the trivia section there was just like a line just a single note that was like yeah part of nolan's uh, character you know being a famous liar in the world uh, might actually be based on uh, Louis de Rougemont who is a Swiss explorer that was discovered to also be a liar. And that was like all that was on the wiki. I don't, I don't even think it was that much. It was just like, yeah, his design might be based on Louis de Rougemont. And I'm like, who the hell is Louis de Rougemont? So I went down the rabbit hole on that one, right? Hashtag not a furry, of course. And so I started reading about Louis de Rougemont. And this dude, my God, this is a fascinating human being. I gotta tell you about this guy, all right? History has forgotten him. I have never heard anybody mention him. But Louis de Rougemont, holy crap. All right, so first I should say his real name was not Louis de Rougemont. Louis de Rougemont was like his pen name that he was published under. His his tales of great high adventure were published under the name Louis de Rougemont, okay? But his real name was Henry Louis Grin, which I may or may not be pronouncing correctly. He was born in Switzerland in 1847, okay? So, the basic idea here is in, in his younger years, he seemed like he was uh, honestly like kind of well-to-do. He had a good education. He learned English fluently at a young age. Uh, he was a footman to a certain actress, like a popular actress back then and eventually even became the butler to the governor of Western Australia. All right. So the butler of a governor of Australia, that's, that's something like, that's not just like you're living in a gutter. Like that's something to work with. Right. However, he only stayed at that job for about five months before he left because, uh, he was too ambitious and arrogant. Okay. Now look, I don't know this guy and I didn't start reading about this guy until just today, but I've read like other stories and biographies of people throughout history. I can kind of click together the kind of personality this dude had at least from what i'm seeing here this was a guy that was like yeah yeah i'm a i'm a butler to this governor and everything but i don't want to be a butler i don't want to be the guy that like serves tea i want to be the guy that everybody talks about right i want to be like i, I want to be like this famous adventurer in the world i have i have high dreams for the seas and stuff like that's the kind of stuff i want to do right but he never really ended up doing that i think he did captain a ship for a time but he ended up wrecking it or he ended up losing the ship or whatever and and uh, in 1898, this is when this gets interesting, okay? So he spends a little bit of time in Australia, and then he goes back to England, all right? He's in England, and while in England in 1898, in August, he sends a story to this uh, famous magazine at the time under the name Louis de Rougemont, and the story is just, it, it's complete bullshit. It's like, I am Louis de Rougemont. I traveled the Australian bush for over 30 years. I've rode turtles across the ocean. I met indigenous tribes in the outback, and they revere me as a god. Here's all my adventures, and he sends that to this famous magazine. The magazine publishes it, and everybody overnight is like captivated with the adventures of Louis de Rougemont. Louis de Rougemont, did not do shit you know it's like none of that like oh no i'm just i'm just making this story up and thing is he wasn't even really because there's stuff in there that like even in the 19th century even in 19, 1898 you know i know there's no there's no easy communication i think the idea that he might have had was okay i'm in england telling this story and it's being published in an english newspaper or magazine and i'm telling stories about something that happened literally on the other side of the planet in Australia, in like New Zealand, and I think also New Guinea also. It was like, oh, I was in New Guinea, you know, doing all these crazy adventures. 
And um, I think he thought like, oh, well, no one will be able to connect that I wasn't because it's like on the other side of the planet and this is 1898, right? There's no social media to be like, hey, I think this guy is kind of full of crap, right? But it didn't take very long. It's not like he lived in the lap of luxury for like 10 years before he was found out as a fraud. Um, uh, from what I understand, it was only a, like less than a year. It was like August of 1898 to like May of the following year, 1899, uh, when he was published in this magazine and he kept sending stories in and everyone was like, my God, this is a crazy adventurer. This is nuts. Um, but then it was discovered and it didn't take really long because people figured out pretty quickly like, okay, you can't like ride a turtle across the ocean. And then he's like, okay, this is a map of Australia. Show us where you traveled. And like, oh, I can't tell you. I've signed an NDA. He's like, all right, well, what about all those tribal languages that you spoke? Apparently you've mastered like the indigenous population of Australia, like all these different tribes scattered across the outback. Apparently you learned their language. Let's hear it. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, my throat's kind of sore today, guys. You know, I can't, I can't do that. He also at one point, like a month after his uh, story was published in like, so in like September of 1898, I think he gave a lecture at this conference for like geography and anthropology right like it's just like a month after the story it's like wow we, we need to get this guy in our conference look at all the crazy stuff he did in australia he navigated the entirety of the australian outback that is crazy for 19th century we need to get this guy so they get the guy he's like come speak at our conference and all the experts of geography and anthropology are there like it's like oh yes let's let's listen to this man louis de rougemont let's listen to his exploits oh yes i'm quite interested in how he communicates with the indigenous tribes of Australia. This should be quite interesting. <laughs> I would give so much money to be in the audience during that demonstration. Would you not? Would you not? It would be like he gets up there and he's like, so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I met with um, the aboriginal tribes. Um, in this, uh, there's like a giant map of Australia behind him and he's just like, in, in this general region uh right around you know it was like here but not here and um it, you know i i sailed on a turtle to get from this side to this side uh w which tribe revered you as a god again uh oh all of them I, I mean not all of them i mean kind of some of them but you know like that would have been like great that would be like if i told like a crazy story right now like if i just wrote an article and sent it to like the new york times or some shit and i'm like oh yeah i traveled to this lost island in the middle of the uh the pacific ocean in the south pacific there's an island uh filled with all these rare birds crazy birds i rode on some of them and i trained them and their eggs are super they, they, they laid silver and gold eggs and then I came back to civilization and I published that. So they actually published the story and everyone actually believed it. And they're like, wow, this is crazy. And then they call me up and like, uh, teching, we need you to come to the ornithologist conference next month. You know, the international ornithologist conference where all the bird experts are going to be. And I'm like, okay. And I, I go and I'm up there and I'm like, all right, talk about this crazy island. I'm like, well... The birds, they could, uh, well, uh, well, first off, this is a rare duck. This is the two-horned, uh, duck. It's, it's quite ripped, quite muscular. Uh, that's a very rare bird there. Uh, this, uh, I, I'm not really sure who designed this, but this, this was on the island. This as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's this kind of stuff I found. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was Louis de Rougemont. And I just, I like, that's like the famous liar from our world that apparently everybody has forgotten about because I've never heard anybody talk about. I mean, it was like 120 years ago, granted. It's really sad how his life, his life ended though. He never had another high point after that. Um, he went to a few conferences after this where he was like, just basically booed off stage. Like, boo, you're a phony. That's basically it. Uh, during World War One, I, I think he tried to develop like a, a meat substitute for the war effort, but pff, that didn't go anywhere. And he died like penniless and alone in like 1921. So <laughs> that's um, that's the legacy of Louis de Rougemont. Um, yeah, so that I just wanted to tell you that little side story I just learned about today because that's that was very interesting. I have to say. All right, well. Um, Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm glad that we finally managed to do this. Um, I'm glad I learned a little bit about history today. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, this will be Techie 101. Nolan video concluded. Signing out!